Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, sorry about being late. Uh, I had a bit of an issue this morning. Uh, and I also still need to make my presentation, so apologies if it looks a little bit put together, but I hope I have something interesting to tell you, or that at least you'll take some things away. So I was trying to figure out what I was going to talk about today, and uh, I figured that one of the most interesting things about us is uh, how we changed uh, our company since uh, 2009 uh, until now, because we went through a lot of changes, and a lot of these changes were actually responsible for the success that we enjoy nowadays. So uh, it is uh, hopefully for you, it's going to, you're going to take something away from it. Uh, very quickly, uh, what am I doing here? Uh, why am I uh, at an indie conference? Uh, we've always been very independent, let's put it that way. Uh, independent of all electric. I've been making games for 32 years apparently. Uh, so that's due to the fifth thing there. Uh, because I started programming when I was 11 and I made my first game, which was a skiing game on the ZX81. Um, so, the list of numbers that you have there, the thing that they have in common, other than uh, 1983, which is when I started making games, is that they were all the years all in which I almost went bankrupt trying to make games and getting them published, or at least to a general audience. Alright, and the go bottles that you're seeing there, that was the Larian Secret since 1997. We had these big boxes of Coke on which we put our tables, and whenever we ran out of money, we went with the Coke boxes, then we didn't have any tables anymore, but we got some more money. And then we reinvested it in Coke, and it like this, it went on. Anyway, uh, so uh, we went through quite some hard years, but then uh, last year we published the original scene, it was very uh, successful. And uh, yesterday we won the biggest award that we ever won, it's the Golden Beaver. Uh, so we're very proud of it. Uh, we've never had a Golden Beaver before. So uh, we're really, really happy. But um, the thing is, uh, I was going to talk about change, so let's go head back to 2009. And uh, let's start with this. I just released my lowest scoring game ever. It's a Ultra Dragon, it's on the Xbox 360, it has a Metacritic of 62. And uh, it's, it's good that we're talking about Lego Draconis because the person who gave us the idea of making a game of changing into a dragon is sitting here, it's none other than Rihanna Pratchett, uh, who had worked on a previous game, which was Beyond, Beyond Divinity. And she said, why don't you make a game about turning into a dragon? And little did she realize the consequences it was going to have, this one email that she had uh, for our company. So let's head back, we're October 25th, 2009, released the lowest scoring game ever. Uh, we pretty much lost everything that we've built up financially over the last years. Uh, half my team is looking to go work for EA or for Activision or what have you. Uh, we're not getting paid at all from Bosch. That was, uh, well, it wasn't really you who were used to that. Banks calling because we took a lot of attempts to finish the actual game. Uh, my wife doesn't want to talk to me anymore and she wants to move. Uh, I'm a physical wreck and doctor tells me I have to uh, take another job. And uh, so there we are, 2009, so it wasn't really good. And so surprisingly this morning as I uh, was looking like um, how am I going to approach this subject and talk about it, I found back a PowerPoint which I never shared with anybody. It was a PowerPoint I made for myself on that day, that's why I know it was October 25th, 2009, and so I'm going to share it with you now because it was rather um, revealing to myself when I looked at it that the things that I wrote there, what an impact they actually had over the next six years, and how it actually was almost like a Nostradamus prophecy. So, uh, we'll have a look at it. So, this was the 360 version of Able Dragon, 62%, that's really bad, and 72 for PC, it was better, but it was actually also really bad. So, what changed? Okay, well, uh, this is the Larry roadmap from that day, 25th October. It's, uh, it was called Quantum Leap, and the idea was making it because I needed something to re-inspire my team. My team was really, I mean, they were, they were wrecked. They had worked for, uh, for several months doing crunch, and then suddenly the critics came out and they smashed the game. They were calling it a technical wreck. Uh, it was a mishmash of ideas. It was really, it was really bad. So, uh, we had obviously fallen again in the trap of this fantastic triangle, which most people in development know. It's uh, time, budget, quality. It's something that every single producer in uh, the industry will keep on repeating. Uh, if you have a problem with, uh, with your game, one of these things has to give. You can never have uh, all of them uh, staying constant. So, either you have to move the time if you don't want to move budget and quality, either you have to move the quality if you don't want to move time and budget, or either you have to change the budget if you don't want to make a change time and quality. And so the big problem that we always had was that we didn't have enough money, we didn't have enough time, 
but we always wanted more quality. We were always very ambitious about how we were going to make our games. So this was a very, very big problem for us. And so, being an optimistic person, I tried to be optimistic as I was preparing how I was going to share my big speech with my team and telling them where we were going. So I said, well, you know, the game reception wasn't that negative. There were some guys that liked it. You know, there's always like this couple of reviewers that give everything a nine. So I said, that's, that's, that's fairly positive. And PC, you know, 72, that's just because the guys that didn't know what the game is, they rated it lowly, but most people rated it high. So it's not that bad. So I said, okay, well, game reception positive. I didn't mean it, but I mean, and sometimes you have to, when talking to a team, you have to be really, really over optimistic, otherwise the morale completely breaks down. So I said, well, our credibility is very increased, and uh, I based that on the fact that we actually released a bad game on the Xbox 360. We've, we, we've managed to get through the DCR, so that was already a pretty big success. And he said, well, I'm getting a lot of experience. I mean, I think obviously their experience has increased, not necessarily in a good way, but we gain experience. Uh, finances, uh, they're a little bit on the shaky side. Uh, we're pretty much bankrupt, but I wasn't going to say it. That's the, the modern way of saying it is we're borderline. Uh, but we're improving, uh, and I admit that there's some morale problems, and, but we've seen pro fragmentary improvements, I call it then, over our processes. Uh, but the worst part was that we lost a lot of opportunity, and it was true actually. And uh, the big frustration we had at the game about Ego uh, Dragon uh, is we didn't want to release it. We were no way ready for release, but we had a publisher which was in a lot of financial trouble, even more than we were back then and they forced us to release it. We wanted to wait like six to eight months more with releasing the game and that's the biggest frustration because you've been working day and night for like several years on one game with one vision, one thing that you're only, you only, you wake up with it, you go to sleep with it and then some idiots at the other side or in another country decide that they are going to publish it and you go like shit, you know, all those years are wasted because you know what's going to happen. People are going to receive it badly, they're never going to see what could have been and uh, that's it. And if you're not careful, that's also, it's over for you. So this was in 2009, it belonged in that long list of numbers where we almost went down. So I said the worst case scenario is by bye bye Larian, it is over for us, okay? And this is obviously going to be the case, I said, if we do not manage to get our quality up, yeah, all right? We know that we can't handle budget, we know that we can't handle time, but if we now are going to refrain also on quality, then we're completely fucked. So, the best thing that we could do would be obviously that we managed to uh, main uh, control time, control budget, control quality. In that case, we would have rewards all over the board. The board. I mean, if we were to release a game with a high metacritic, which was on budget and on time, then obviously. of the tree lies the perfect game. And so every single time that you have a choice that you make in that search tree, you have an opportunity to fuck it up. Or you have a chance that you are getting in the right direction. So when you are making a game, and you made a number of choices, you made a couple of bad choices, it pays to return, but sometimes you have to backtrack so far in your search tree of what is the perfect game that you can actually completely ruin your game because you'll never manage to finish it. And so, too many iterations destroys financing, it destroys opportunities, destroys morale also in the team because I think we have no guidance, we don't know where we're going, there's no vision, and obviously it reduces quality because the time that you have and the resources that you have to make your game they start decreasing. So the things that you could hear around Larian back then on October 25th and around the time also was the idiot at the top doesn't know what he's talking about, which was me obviously. Um, we haven't clear design, that's a very classic one. Uh, there are too many changes being made, that is a criticism at the iterations. We also have a lot of shit with the middleware, so we were dependent on a lot of middleware layers back then. It was, uh, well, I'm not going to name them, but we used a lot of third-party technology that didn't really work as advertised. Obviously, we had our publisher that didn't really care about us, but except for the fact that our game wasn't ready, that were angry at us. We had, were under ca capacity for the ambitions that we had. There was obviously the competition that we had from other developers and our processes were pretty much uh, bad. So, 
Well, no, well, that doesn't matter. I actually don't remember what it means, that one. But uh, So what are we going to do about it? All right, so I'll just quickly go through, well, this was, the, this was not a bad, one, a bad idea. Obviously, we needed to work out our financial problems. This was the first thing, because if we weren't going to get over our financial problems, then there was just nothing to be done. People need to be paid, people have to uh, bring food back home for their families, and so forth. So, uh, we had to start uh, doing what you typically do in Belgium, the game development, you get subsidies, that's, that's one way of getting financing. Uh, we needed to do some work for hire, so that we were going to have some money in there. And then we needed to do something, which was going to uh, re-establish the faith of our, of our players into uh, the games that we were making, which was these Divinity RPGs. All right. So, uh, we decided, so these were the projects that we worked on back then, so just to give you an idea, it was an add-on for Divinity 2, which was also going to be the game that was going to fix everything. Then we made some educational games, we made a Flash game for the, the, the Flemish public broadcaster, and then we did a couple of research projects, research projects because they are the thing that bring in money, and then uh, hopefully they allow you to survive. It is one of the uh, problems of uh, Belgian game development. So, and then we had to work in the air, Divinity 3, Divinity on PS3, as if. So, my other observation back then, and this was an interesting one, was that you were going to... I've always had this, um, since I've been doing this for some time, I've always observed the same patterns in the games industry. You have a new platform that's coming out, it's very accessible to develop, so you have plenty of people that are jumping on it. For instance, uh, if you had an iPhone, the accessibility of development was very low, so a lot of people were developing for games for it. So what happens is initially you have like this enormous amount that comes out, lots of people buy it, people start expecting more quality, so you get an increase in quality, you get less developers that can deliver that quality, and eventually you get consolidation. And this has been going on since the very beginning of the games industry. It was true in the ZX81, it was true in the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, up to the Amiga, up to the PC, all the way to nowadays uh, on modern platforms where the accessibility of development is actually quite high because you have Unity, you have Unreal Engine, and all the other engines. Uh, whereas back in my day, the only thing that you had was assembly. So that was a uh, accessibility is high, but it means also that there's a lot of people making games, so you get oversaturation, uh, what you call a red ocean. So you get fragmentation of the market, and so that means that you're going to have a very top layer of development uh, quality, and then you'll have an under layer, and so people are going to automatically, automatically uh, gravitate towards the, uh, the, the higher quality, and this makes it obviously harder to make games. And, okay. The other thing that I did see was that there was nobody making RPGs anymore. So RPGs is a horror thing, so that was interesting. Uh, because we saw sequel after sequel after sequel of games that are being selling, so a lot of consolidation. And I also realized, because again, I've, I've done this over time, there's always something that's going to change something. I didn't know back then Kickstarter wasn't, thing, what wasn't a thing when I was making this thing. So I didn't realize that Kickstarter was going to come, but I, I said something's going to come. So, the, uh, well, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever, okay, yeah, this is more interesting thing. So, the decision was made, like, we need to fix that quality thing, right? As, as long as you have quality, it's going to somehow sell, that was the true belief. And so, the, this is based on the observation, content has always been king. It's always been content that defined the games industry. And if you can't fix the content, no matter what you're going to do in terms of marketing or, or talking or communicating, it's going to, to, it's going to help. So we need to fix those ratings. That was the, uh, the primary thing. But obviously that also meant that I had to fix, do something about the budget and I had to do something about the time. Otherwise there was no way I was going to be able to fix the quality. I also uh, realized that the, one of the reasons we had so many iterations is that uh, we, um, because we grew very fast when we were making a good record, is that we had uh, preferred capacity over talent. We hired too fast, rather than actually saying, you know what, we really need to be sure that the developer who's doing a certain thing is very talented, because talented in game development is often defined by the amount of iterations that you need to make something good. It's stupid to think that you won't need iterations, but if you only need three iterations instead of 20 iterations, well then you're going to make faster progress. So that's where that came from, talent over capacity. 
Also figured out that I've been doing it since 1997 until 90, 2009, and every single time somebody released my games before I was ready with making the games, or something, somebody told me, you're not going to do that, you're going to do it this way, or somebody just didn't care about the marketing. So I always had this feeling that, that, that the games did not uh, go to the foreground the way that they should have been put to the foreground. So I said, we need to control the publishing ourselves. Right? So that meant, I call it here strategic financing instead of tactical financing. Tactical financing basically means you try to find money this month so that you can pay the bills of this month and then in the next month you do the same thing and same thing and same thing. It doesn't really lead to a very solid business. What's better if is you have what's called strategic financing, you're safe for a couple of years. At that moment I didn't have a clue how to do it. But I did realize that it meant selling something out because otherwise it wasn't going to work. And in the past we had been very protective and here it was like as long as we don't do something about the fact that we can have some stability financially, we will not be able to take the time to be able to bring our quality up. And this the latter part was one of the most important things. Nobody was having fun anymore. When we started making games, we had lots of fun. And then here we were in 2009, everybody was angry at one another, and nobody was actually enjoying it. So how can you make a game if you don't enjoy making the game? Uh, how can you make a game that's fun if you don't enjoy making the game yourself? So uh, we started doing all of these things in varieties of uh, capacities, and the first part that we did was we made um, a game called Dragon Knight Saga. Dragon Knight Saga was um, basically the same game, Ego Dragonis, with some additional content, but we spent most of the development that we did on it, we spent fixing everything which was wrong with it. And this led to an 82 meta score for uh, the PC version from 72, and a 72 for the X360 version from 62. So that was a 10% increase, and it also had an impact on the sales. The sales were much higher, because people suddenly say, hey, this is not a bad game. Still a bit clunky here and there, but as you can see, we started getting 90s and uh, 85s, and then obviously we had the guys who still didn't like it, and they gave it a 60, so they brought this meta score down. But that was a pretty respectable score, and our sales were suddenly much better. So that gave us the breathing room. The thing that we did, though, is we did use a publisher. We gave him like a real big, big, big chunk of the royalty, so that we were going to get the money to finish it. But it put us in the stage. We're 2010 now. It put us in the stage where we could like go back to investors and say, hey, our games sell. And this was a very crucial thing because that was the only thing we still needed to be able to convince them to give us some extra money which was going to lead to the next phase in our development and which is what ultimately led now to Original Sin, the games that are coming and one game in between which I will talk about in a second. Alright, so what you're seeing now is an other um, presentation which I copy pasted here, but then I had to run, otherwise I was going to be late here, as I was. So I'm going to jump forward a little bit, uh, and I want to bring you to uh, today first. Alright, so Get Original Sin, it's been uh, on top of the charts on Steam for a very long time, to, uh, uh, this summer, it sold really well. And uh, obviously, uh, Steam was a very big, uh, how shall I say, um, I can't think of the word right now. It was a very big something that helped uh, with bringing the game to market because before uh, we had always had to go through these publishers and the distributors because we had to have the logistical uh, section of uh, creating the game sorted out. We needed to be able to put them into stores and that's why we went to these people. Whereas Steam obviously with digital distribution allowed us to, to bring it there. But Steam brought us something else also. It brought us early access. And before we went to early access, we went to Kickstarter. But Kickstarter and early access combined gave us the thing that we needed and that I, that I afterwards realized was the most important thing. It first of all gave us the time to finalize the, the last phase of the creation of a game. We've always been good at coming up with ideas. We've always been good at prototyping them. We've always sucked at actually finishing them. But by putting the games on early access, we suddenly had the time to see what the players were doing with the features that we put in there, to see what was wrong with it, and to then actually spend the time on polishing things. And it was probably uh, throughout, if I look back now on all the games that we've made, that was the thing which was missing every single time. And it is the, probably the biggest takeaway that you need to do, uh, that you need to take away for your own games today. It's the polishing phase. Um, 
It sounds simple, it sounds straightforward, and you've probably heard it a million times, but I can only say to you what it's done for us. And I'll start by talking about Dragon Commander. I don't have slides about Dragon Commander, so I'll have to uh, tell you to you like that. Uh, Dragon Commander is a game which was the first independent game that we published, truly self-published. It was released in 2013, in August 2013. We started working on it in the beginning of 2011. It was just after we released Dragon Knight Saga. And we, for that game, we built our own engine. So it was also very, uh, something that was very new. We didn't have an engine ourselves, we started building our own engine. And it was far out. It, com it combined uh, things like RTS with strategy gaming, with RPG, uh, with all kinds of things. It was a crazy game in which you could fly with a dragon, with a jetpack on its back, at uh, breathtaking speeds. Uh, it was a fun game to make. We had a lot of fun making it. It has a Metacritic of 76, so it's not that it was like the best game in the world. But it did allow us to enable a lot of technology. And as we were making it, we were faced again with the problems of the triangle where we had. We were going over budget, we were going over time, but the quality of the game was quite high. And at some point, it came the dreaded moment where I said, okay, we're going to run completely over budget, so we need to intervene. And so then we uh, decided to do something. We focused on the very first part of the game and bring the quality really high there. So uh, we did that because we said if we don't get the quality really high of this completely crazy concept, nobody's going to play it. We released it as a pre-order version so people could start playing it in beta. And what we noticed is that the guys that only looked at it for a couple of hours wrote really positive previews about it. And like they, they were going to score it like at 85%, 90%. And we said, well that's strange because we know the game has lots of trouble, but everybody's like really ecstatic about it. So we kept on doing our publishing thing, shifting most of our resources to the beginning of the game and not to the ending of the game. And lo and behold, the game is released and we get 85s, 90s, and only afterwards we get lower scores by people who actually played the game much further. So the first part of the game, the polishing, gave it high scores, and it turns out that a lot of these people just reviewed the beginning of the game and they never bothered to fit it to review the end of the game. So we said to ourselves, well, that's interesting, right? That is very interesting. So the thing is that if we have the same game and we polish part of it and we don't polish the other part of it, we get much higher ratings for the part that we've polished. So comes Original Sin, which was the other game that was in development at Larian. And we look at it and we say, like, this game needs over a year extra to be able to actually make it a really good game. But if we polish it, like we've done it with Drag Commander, there's a big chance that we're going to actually have a successful game. And so what we did is we said, okay, well, right now we're going to take the triangle, we're going to say that the budget can just go wherever it wants to go, we're not going to cheat on the quality, and we will let time take its course. So as much time as it takes. So it was all in for the company. Every single thing, down to my house, to my mortgage, everything that I had, went into Original Sin, and we extended development with over a year. We went to Kickstarter, we went to Early Access, we looked, you don't want to know, the things that we did to finance it up to the very last day, I mean, the, the, yeah, it's a, there was a lot that we had to do. But it paid off, because it was that level of polish, together with the aid from the people who were backing us on Kickstarter and the people that were giving us feedback on Early Access, allowed us to finalize, finally figure out the thing that we've been looking for for so long as we were developing our computer games is how do you make a hit game and the secret turn, as it turned out, was by finishing it, right? Not by saying, well, here's something and it's good, but I don't, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to cut this piece or going to split it in a couple of games and sell it as different episodes. No, it was really by we saying, we're going to finish it and we're going to finish it completely. We still took some shortcuts, but they were minor compared to the shortcuts that we had taken in the past. And the result, of course, is that we, uh, yeah, we scored very highly. So now, if you look at the development that we're doing nowadays at, uh, at Larian, it is like everything is about taking their time. I think we're taking too much of our time right now, so there's a bit, uh, too little stress. But we've learned that it, it really pays to be absolutely without any compromise when it comes to finishing your game, because when you do take all of that time, regardless of the hardships that it takes, yeah, you are going to uh, be successful. So the thing that I learned over this entire period, and then that will lead me uh, more or less to my conclusion, I guess, is that uh, you have to embrace iteration. You have to try to decrease the amount of iteration so that you're efficient. And this you can do by increasing talent, increasing experience, maybe by uh, uh, managing your ambitions also. But you have to make sure that you iterate sufficiently to the point that your game is at a high quality level. And once you've done that, 
then technically speaking, there's nothing that can prevent you from being successful with your game, except, and then let's, let's go to the previous slide, if you do not amplify it. All right, so this is from a presentation on how to publish, or how to self-publish, so, um, but it is an important one, so I, I do want to uh, bring that to you also, because I see a lot of indie games which are being released without this amplification uh, fact behind it. You need to amplify uh, the fact that you made a game, and you need to amplify it towards your target audience, uh, whoever they are, that this game is for them. Because if they don't, they don't get that message, they're not going to play the game. And this was the second thing that we got right. Other than the fact that we took no compromises on the quality of the game, we also spent a tremendous amount of time and a tremendous amount of energy and effort on actually publishing the game. So we started playing it as we were publishers, and we did a lot of things wrong, but we also did a few things right, and they helped us tremendously in making original sin a success. Because chances were that if we wouldn't have done that, we would have still been in that early access with a few developers trying to say to stick to our vision of no compromises. But because we managed to amplify what this game was, who it was for, we had sufficient momentum that we could uh, continue with the full team on finishing our game. So I don't know how much time I have left actually. Where is it? Ten minutes? If you want questions, Yeah, okay. So well, I can actually uh, close and ask a question because if I get into this section, since I was a little bit late, it'll take longer. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of things that you can do, even if you have no money, even if you have, you have no time, which can help with uh, publishing your game. So uh, you should invest in those if you're developing a game yourself. Because there's too many of you uh, here in the Belgium scene also that I've seen that release their game without actually uh, spending sufficient time on the amplification or preparing their target audience for it. And it's a waste of all that energy that you've done. Because even if you're going to make the perfect game, it's, there's nobody who's going to know about it. And you know this, I guess, because you hear it all the time, so there must be some creative truth to it. Uh, you will not manage uh, to ultimately sell it. And sales are important because sales allow you to make your next game, to make, put more into your next game. So it's what's going to define your ability to make a game in the future. Anyway. Um, I ranted enough for 25 minutes, I guess. So, um, if you have any questions, this will then be the time for the questions. First question. Yeah. Uh, you say there that you shouldn't overdo social networks. What does. Well, what do you mean? What, how can you overdo it? Uh, well, uh, so, well, this is actually. I have to take another one there. Um, do I have that one in there? Uh, I have a thing about triage in here. So you're an indie developer, right? So what's the thing that you lack the most, other than money? Can you tell me? Where is that thing? It's time. You don't have a lot of time because you need all your time to develop, right? So when you pick your battles, you have to pick the right battles when you're trying to, um, to, 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 well, you need to maximize, maximize your, the impact of your punches, right? Social media obviously works, but it can take a lot of effort. So, and there's other ways which can, can be vastly more effective with which you can reach your target audience. Because we started uh, doing a lot of stuff on, on social media and we've tried to, to measure what's the impact actually on sales, what's the impact of it on um, people getting us feedback to our game. We got quite a few from it, but we discovered that there's other things that you can do that actually give you more impact. For instance, um, well, you can also say it's also social media. Uh, I write a blog, all right? It's at lar.net. The impact of that thing in terms of messaging, if we want to try to get a message out to the world, is vastly bigger than a post on Facebook. So, and if we put a post on Facebook, it reaches some people, but may not necessarily the right people. So that is the other part. Uh, of the lesson that we learned there. That said, we're really bad at social media, so maybe that's why I'm saying that. Okay, so we, we could probably be a lot better at social media, but we haven't figured out the right profile for that yet. And it's also not the thing that we want to be busy with, because to be honest, if it were up to us, we wouldn't do all of this publishing thing, we would just be making our games. But uh, obviously, since I just told you, it's, that's a bad idea. You need to spend a lot of time on this amplification stuff. Uh, 